Okay, good evening. Thanks everybody for being here. And this is the eighth installment of the discussion of the book, How Wealth Rules the World, Saving Our Communities and Freedoms from the Dictatorship of Property. And um, tonight's chapter is titled The Pretense of Present of Representation. Um, and just to start things off, um, just a, a couple of observations that you know, this is the 23rd year of the 21st century, and it's still possible to, to discern the basic unfairness when authoritarians twist the rules to advantage the already advantaged, and at the same time subdue the rest to serve their priorities. Um, voter suppression among them, uh, we know about that, we hear about that in the news all the time, gerrymandering, minority rule through things like the electoral college and corporate personhood. And that's something that we covered in last month's chapter. And also the constricting of the choices between two political parties um, and how they narrow the spectrum of policy options. Um, and so we're going to be talking about um, really the constriction of democratic participation uh, in governance in tonight's chapter, the, pre the pretense of representation. Um, but this isn't all new stuff. It's not like suddenly one of the parties decided to uh, dig in and make some choices that were going to strip us of our, of our rights of representation or um, our ability to affect uh, the political process. Um, it's really one of the longest running scams since the fantasy of democratic choice was claimed to be real for citizens um, in the United States empire. And it's really a lie of historic proportions that was first articulated and simultaneously covered up in the Federalist Papers, where the folks who wrote the U.S. Constitution, the Federalists, um, tried to sell the new rules for elite governance, and they masterfully disguised it in the labyrinth of deceit woven into the U.S. Constitution. So today, let's consider the claim that we don't have a democracy, but a republic. I hear that often when I talk about uh, people's right to self-determination and communities' rights of self-determination. And um, often the pushback is, well, we live in a republic. It's ne it was never meant to be a democracy. Um, well, but the will of the people is supposed to be represented by decisions of the folks that they elect to be their public servants. I mean, that's the theory. And it's a narrative that it's held justice in check for two and a half centuries because people don't know how to push back and say, you say we're a republic and you say that we have political representation but it's very difficult for us to discern that, to see how that actually um, takes place in the real world. So I'm gonna start out as I do um, each of the chapters with a quotation that I think is appropriate to the information we're gonna to cover tonight. And this is a quote from William G. Domhoff, and it's from his book, Power at the Local Level, Growth Coalition Theory. And so here's the quote. <clears throat> to the shock and dismay of land-based elites, the workers who poured into the cities between 1870 and 1920 challenged elite rule through Democratic Party machines and the Socialist Party. So the growth elites created a good government ideology and a set of reforms that literally changed the nature of local governments and took them out of the reach of the upstarts. In other words, the rules were changed for governing in cities and towns and municipalities so that the very large influx of immigrants, mostly from Europe, would not be able to change the balance of power um, by participating in the electoral process, by participating in their local governments. So the, the, that really covers a large part of the theme um, today because we're talking about the pretense of representation. Um, 
but it's about people being represented and the interests that they have in the places where they live actually uh, being taken seriously by government. So the first section of the chapter is titled, One Step Forward, Two Steps Back. During colonial times and up until the mid 1840s, the right to vote and hold public office in many states could be exercised only by white men who owned a minimum amount of property. The poor white man's civil rights movement was one of the first people's movements to wrest exclusive authority to govern from the hands of the landowning gentry, or so they thought. They demanded what they called universal manhood suffrage and eliminated property requirements for white men to vote and hold office by waging a brief civil war known as the Door War in the state of Rhode Island. But it was a Pyrrhic victory. Judicial maneuvers like the Dartmouth decision allowed the property class to strip municipalities of autonomous governing authority and thereby minimize the political gains propertyless white men had won. Historian J. Allen Smith describes how this new impediment to, to local lawmaking arose within a generation of the final extension of the rights of suffrage to white men without land. He wrote this, quote, it's easily seen that the removal of property qualifications for voting and office holding has had the effect of retarding the movement toward universal municipal home rule. Before universal suffrage was established, the property owning class was in control both of state and city government. This made state interference in local affairs unnecessary for the protection of property. But with the introduction of universal suffrage, the conservative element which dominated the state government naturally favored a policy of state interference as the only means of protecting the property owning class in the cities. In this, they were actively supported by the corrupt politicians and selfish business interests that sought to exploit the cities for private ends. Our municipal conditions are thus the natural result of this alliance between conservatism and corruption, end quote. So it was the expansion of voting rights to white men who were not property holders that prompted federal and state leaders to restrict the authority of local governments to legislate and enforce local laws. Allowing a larger, predominantly unbanked electorate to make local laws that reined in the power of money was unacceptable to the ruling class. Smith said of the times that, quote, the attitude of the well-to-do classes toward local self-government was profoundly influenced by the extension of the suffrage. The removal of property qualifications tended to divest the old ruling class of its control in local, local affairs. Thereafter, property owners regarded with distrust local government in which they were outnumbered by the newly enfranchised voters. The fact that they may have believed in a large measure of local self-government when there were su suitable restrictions on the right to vote and to hold public office did not prevent them from advocating an increase in state control after the adoption of manhood suffrage." End quote. When voting rights were extended to black males with the 15th Amendment and eventually to women with the 19th Amendment, the propertied class focused more purposefully on disenfranchising them from meaningful local self-government. John Forrest Dillon, with his Dillon's rule that resurrected the Dartmouth decision on municipal subordination to states, was intoned from the Iowa bench in 1868. In 1870, the 15th Amendment guaranteed the right of suffrage to all men, regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. In 1891, with European immigration in high gear, the U.S. Supreme Court made Dillon's rule apply to every municipality in the nation, and the court doubled down, making Dillon's rule the law of the land in 1907. The effect on local democracy was profoundly negative. According to Alan Trachtenberg, 
Professor Emeritus of English and American Studies at Yale University. During the period of rapid industrialization, corporate controlled policymakers supported an unparalleled influx of immigrants. With a rash of farmstead divestitures, relocation of the dispossessed to the cities, and the influx of newcomers from abroad made for larger municipal communities. These developments alarmed those same policymakers, minimizing what effect extending the right to vote to a rapidly expanding unbanked and underbanked population would have at the local level become their top priority. New arrivals in the Northeast taking jobs in the, core, in the coal fields, factories, and rail yards transformed American polit politics, according to Trachtenberg, as surely as did the emancipation of the slaves in the South. Quote, expectant immigrants arrived with aspirations for democratic participation and found that they were at least welcome, the least welcome of Americans, except in as much as their bodies could become prosthetics for the corporate class's will to power, end quote. <clears throat> the political parties pandered to ethnic interest and perfected a machine politics that played on social divisions. Federalist descendants of both major parties strove to remove representation of municipal communities in state legislatures. Where Dartmouth and Dillon's role stripped municipalities of their authority to govern on behalf of local populations, representation of counties and munis municipalities in state legislatures was disrupted with the invention of politically drawn voting districts. By atomizing individual voters into districts that were blind to municipal and community cohesion, the political parties, which are private corporations run by the wealthy class, made collective political action by the hoi polloi impossible. And I'm not sure that everybody understands or realizes that the major political parties in the United States are actually corporations and that they are run um, internally um, and do not um, are not legally required to respond um, to the voters. So moving on, rather than members of communities that had representation in state assemblies, residents of American municipalities became statistics that could be manipulated and lumped into consciously structured assemblages that served the priorities of the two-party cartel representing the rights of property. The people's right of association as communities was desecrated so that the collective might of the people could not turn democracy against the whims of wealth. Grouping voters in legislative districts based on party affiliation took the power of the franchise out of the hands of citizens and put it under the control of powerful class. And that's the property class. Private political parties gained a new weapon to fend off democratic collaboration among citizens. They had an effect and invented a new form of privileged property. And we've talked about privileged property before. The ballots of commoners alienated from their communities and packaged into predictably compliant voting blocks. The practice came to be called gerrymandering after Elbridge Gerry, one of the Massachusetts delegates to the 1787 Philadelphia Federalist Convention, and he's one of the delegates who refused to sign the U.S. Constitution for lack of a Bill of Rights. But then he served as the country's fifth vice president under James Madison. Jerry once wrote this, quote, democracy is the worst of all political evils, end quote. In 1887, one writer for Organized Labor noted that, quote, the members of the state legislature were not chosen as at present, by divisions of counties, but were elected by the county on what we would call a general ticket, so that they represented not a mere number of individuals, but the counties or groups of associated individuals. Not till 1846 were the supervisors authorized in this state to divide counties into election districts, end quote. And so in the same year that Thomas Doerr's Rhode Island Rebellion 
finalized the nationwide civil rights struggle for so-called universal white manhood suffrage, the political party system representing institutionalized wealth inaugurated its strategy to shrink the power of each of those new votes. And that's the end of the, the first section. Um, so I wanted to see if you had any thoughts, comments, questions on that. Um, it's something that I don't think that we here in the 21st century generally think about, uh, that this whole idea of, of voting districts, um, I think that, that there's a sense, oh yeah, that, that's been around since the Constitution was written, and it, it is not. <clears throat> um, the, if we look at the Declaration of Independence, uh, that um, you know that laid out the the reasons for separation from the British Empire. Um, at the core of it was people claiming they demanded the right of local self government, not just the right of self government, because we hear that uh, in our history classes all the time. But it was the right of local self government. There were no state and there was no nation um, before the revolution. It was the local, what we call now think of as municipalities. They weren't municipalities then, just as the town meeting style governments in New Hampshire and, and some other New England um, states, they're not actually, or they weren't originally municipalities. They were sovereign communities of people that were that saw themselves as self-governing. Um, and the idea that they could be broken up and splintered into voting districts chosen by political parties uh, never occurred to anyone. Political parties aren't mentioned in the U.S. Constitution, um, just as corporations are not. The two most powerful forces in American government today aren't mentioned in the Constitution. Okay, well, Ben, thank you for this. Um, um... Having been a uh, regional planner for 35 years and observing <clears throat> some of the mismatches of districting and all of that stuff, uh, and even <clears throat> you know the good government movement, um, I'm having to recalibrate the world <laughs> now with this perspective. So uh, <clears throat> um, it's just quite interesting to me how your your text here um, explains why things don't work very well. And uh, <clears throat> having been, okay, so I'm 77. I went uh, in political science, uh, University of Wisconsin freshman year, um, where the Federalist Papers were the Bible. You know, that was... Uh, so uh, what I was taught in the entire um, history of the way it's supposed to work um, didn't match up. So I, I really appreciate, I'm, I'm, uh, I don't necessarily have a question here, but I want to thank you for doing this. I've, um, I'm kind of late to the party, but I've watched the videos and listened to the books. So I'm just... Uh, recalibrating as you go along let me just say that thanks tom i really appreciate it and and i wasn't aware of what i've written um about in this book um you know going through school either i i had a completely different take on how u.s government was constructed uh it only was when i began doing the community organizing and people were asking me, why can't we get what we want? We're supposed to have, be self-governing. How come we can't protect ourselves? Why are the rights, why is the right to make a profit higher in the eyes of the law than the rights of people to a healthy, um, healthy air, water, you know, a, a clean environment, all of those things? Um, why can't we be the ones who decide what happens where we live? Why does someone in a boardroom across the country decide, and then we have to comply. Uh, and that made me ask hard questions about what I thought I knew. And I think that's what we all have to do. 
we can't make the changes necessary, I don't think, until we understand uh, how we've been deceived. Right. But so, let, yeah. yeah. Well, I, let me just follow up on that because, um, like you, I've been doing my own um, work to sort out. And so I, I, um, I don't want to take up too much time, but I retired in 2008 at the time of the uh, um, economic collapse. And it was at that point I started to begin to question economists because uh, our region, the Northern Shenandoah Valley, we'd done everything right and still, you know, what what's going on? And so we'd been told that the uh, profit motive solves all problems, which obviously it hadn't. So um, in my work, working with local communities, I and by 2011, I decided there had to be something like a community motive because I saw, I'd seen all these people doing all this work, not for their own benefit. So I searched on the internet for the term community motive and I only found one instance of it. And it was in a memo by Aldo Leopold in 1944 that had, wasn't published until 1992. So, and he said, the purpose of education is to create in people the community motive so they'll do the right thing for the right reason. So I've been uh, promoting the term community motive. And again, I have other, other materials. So um, I think uh, community motive is the thing that's missing. And, uh, and again, I've been following CDLF. I went to your last uh, New Orleans event. And so things are coming together. So uh, I'm late to the party, but I hope to uh, be able to add something to it. So I'll just uh, mute myself Great. and let, right. the, let the rest of the people go on. Yeah, and we 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 um, have referred to it as community rights for a long time at Selda. But let me get over to Hahnemann. You had something to say. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the statement about the political parties being corporations just jumped off the page at me. I'm so fed up with both the parties. I just uh, took part in the uh, elections here in our county. And Tom, it sounds like maybe you're in Virginia. Is that correct? Okay, well, let's let's be in touch. I'm here in Virginia, in Buckingham. But um you know, watching these strikes and how powerful these unions are, I think us worker bees need to have a a union in which we all strike against the system. This the unions that that's a topic we don't dive into very much, but the unions um, are very weak right now. It's interesting that they're they've begun to strike and they've begun to flex a little bit. Uh, but back in the, um, well, the end of the 1800s and in the 1930s, um, the, it was a whole, whole other story. And the, the unions were able to force some changes, but they didn't get the changes. And it, it's just too much of a, a, to open up that whole topic. But um, the working people have never really been in charge. They, they've sometimes changed the balance of power but they've never taken control. So I'm going to move on to the next section. And if, if you still, maybe you think you have some thoughts or whatever, jot them down. Um, we Maybe we'll have a couple minutes at the end and we can pick up some things too, but we'll, we'll be pausing again. <clears throat> so the next section um, of the chapter is called Diminishing Returns on Democracy. European immigration to the United States was integral to the transformation of American communities into colonies of properties empire. According to environmental, social, and political historian Samuel P. Hayes, between 1820 and 1860, approximately 5 million people entered the country. Between 1860 and 1890, another 13 and a half million came. And between 1900 and 1930, almost 19 million additional people crossed the Atlantic for a total of 37 and a half million people between 1820 and 1930. By 1900, recent immigrants accounted for about 40% of the residents in the 12 largest American cities. 
with another 20% being second generation immigrants. A habit of loyalty to the party was cultivated as a surrogate for the disenfranchised community. As a result, local party bosses took to instituting systems of patronage, nepotism, and favor trading. Reformist middle-class progressives of the time, seeing their political clout in American society being challenged by a large influx of immigrants and what they saw as the corruption of the political parties, devised programs for professionalizing urban and municipal government. Their schemes mirrored the internal governance of the giant corporations. Efficiency, not democracy, became their watchword. They believed that well-educated, financially successful men should govern American communities, not the sordid majority. The planned dysfunction of municipal government, much like today's planned dysfunction of public schools, created an excuse for reformers to advance plans to privatize many municipal functions. Progressives offered new templates for local government modeled on corporate management. Ethnic neighborhoods resisted such reforms. Despite majority resistance, progressive efforts to put a sheen of responsibility on local government resulted in high sounding reforms that in the end had the effect of subtracting the people from local government. Among the progressives dem democratizing proposals, and there were factions that put them forward with integrity, was the creation of home rule municipalities. The idea was for public municipal corporations to be freed from state dictates. To do this, local constitutions or home rule charters were tendered. They would allow citizen initiative, referendum, and recall, meaning that residents of the community could propose new laws, oppose ones enacted by the local government, and remove unresponsive representatives from office through a petitioning process and a vote. In some, mostly Western states, the powers of municipal initiative, referendum, and recall were even ratified as state constitutional amendments. While municipal home rule was being peddled as a tool for progressive reform, the reformers by and large did not intend to craft home rule as a vehicle for handing over the authority to govern local affairs to peasant majorities. Martin Schaisel, professor emeritus of history at California State University, Los Angeles said this about the urban progressives, quote, like other middle-class groups who in interpreted democracy in terms of property rights, and assumed that government should be in the hands of the well-educated and respectable people, they were frightened by the growing social and political influence of immigrants and workers. They therefore denounced the party system, which permitted the lower class people to acquire such power. In um, a book, The Failure of Universal Suffrage, Francis Parkman wrote this, Two enemies unknown before have risen like spirits of darkness on our social and political horizon, an ignorant proletariat and a half-taught plutocracy, end quote. Parkman called for a crusade against democracy itself. Illuminating this sentiment further, Martin Chazel wrote, quote, to reform-minded members of the middle class, who had a deep and abiding respect for a political system that usually protected the wealth and position of its most valuable citizens, it appeared that popular government had broken out the stable framework in which smaller communities had contained it. Now, to their eyes, mass democracy ran reckless through the large cities and threatened not only private property, but also the authority of local institutions, end quote. According to Chazel, historian Francis Parkman believed that, quote, the diseases of the body politic gathered to a head in the cities, and it was there that the need of attacking them was most urgent, end quote. It was what he called indiscriminate suffrage that allowed, quote, an ignorant proletariat to gain political power. When the 19th Amendment secured the rights of women to vote in 1920, 
even nominal municipal reform and especially the drive for local initiative and referendum rights began to run out of steam. Two world wars intervened and the right of local community self-government languished, a victim of American power projected beyond the borders of all of our municipalities. And that's the end of that subsection. So are there any comments or thoughts or questions? Am I making anybody uncomfortable or angry or happy? <laughs> well, uh, dissonance is, is what I would have to uh, say because, again, <clears throat> the way um, it sounds a lot like the progressives were the bad guys, but the progressives were supposed to be the good guys. So where, where are we? Well, that's a that opens a, a interesting area for conversation because um progressives uh as most of the historians that i've read on this the ones that bother to to say anything about it um see the progressives as folks who had embraced the idea of corporatization of government they didn't call it that they may not have even thought of it. It was more like professionalization. If you think about what democracy is, it doesn't require participants in the democratic process to have PhDs or to be experts in anything in particular other than being experts in citizenship. In other words, um, I live in this community. I am an active member of my community. It doesn't mean I have to be politically active, but, you know, um, I'm the I'm the local expert, you know, me and my neighbors. We are the best experts you're going to meet when it comes to the quality of life here where we live and what we need and the things that aren't working well and the things that are under threat of being harmed. That's who the main experts are. Uh, but if you um, if you replace the idea of democracy without credentials to re to participate in the democratic process other than you know, citizenship. Um, if instead a gloss is laid over top of that, um, and this is what the progressives did, um, they said, no, no, there, it needs to be professionalized. And that gives us the, well, the excuse um, to really um, discount those people who we don't consider to be serious people. And generally, that's poorer people with lesser education. That's people who actually need to have a voice in the system and are denied that voice. And we see the results is that they have been not just marginalized, uh, but essentially banished from the political process. Well, OK, um, so, yeah. Gwen. I'm well, sorry, Tom. Go ahead. Yeah. So the thing is, um, that the same thing is happening again because the subs the suburbs political power is shifting to the rich suburbs and they are the epitome of the professionalized class and they know how to make government work for them so and yeah and and it's the progressive who also identify generally um, with social justice and, and and ideals of how uh, the the government and how uh, the society should work. But there is some, and I, I'm going to, I generally will say that it's probably blind, it's not conscious, uh, but it still does strip um, the a class of people that are not as affluent as they of the right to participate. Um, and it's kind of a, um, I guess it's kind of a patriarchal attitude. You know, we'll take care of you. We we know better. We're better educated. We understand government. We understand, you know, we understand water systems and we understand how to deal with the waste and we understand uh, how to deal with the, you know, all, all of it. And I took biology in college and I know what it means to take care, you know, protect the environment. You know what? People whose kids are sick with cancer know that there's a problem with the environment in a way that people 
um, who know all the biology and the chemistry don't. Right, right. They well, have I mean, an expertise so in it. Being in one of those professionalized jobs for 35 years and not understand <clears throat> and seeing that the other professionals don't really <laughs> know what they're doing and that they don't listen to the people. So it, this is explaining <clears throat> the, the dissonance that, again, urban planning has failed uh, in the United States. You know, so everything people, since... didn't, people didn't live in the cities. The poor people that didn't have a lot of money didn't generally live in the cities until industrialization. And then they were divested of the land they owned that was gobbled up and sent uh, well, I think it's all central control yeah. and, and ownership. Right. OK, so I think and, and my, my point is yeah. this, though, Tom, that urban planning in itself um, has some presumptions, some premises that aren't examined. Oh, I, um, I, one yeah, of them I'm very being aware that, of that. Right. people should live. Yeah, people should live in cities. People should live in ghettos. People no, should live in okay, high but rises. American urban planning really? destroyed the cities. We don't have cities anymore. Well, we have homeless sure they associations. Did. So anyway, well, uh, I would like a one-on-one -on -one with you later to go into some of the weeds that I. Sure. That you're. This is explaining uh, a lot. So uh, and it's it's in the weeds. So I'll I'll mute myself again. But it's um, uh, it's uh, quite interesting. <laughs> All right, Tom. And think let's um, maybe email me and we can set up a time to talk. We can you know actually decide how much time we want. Gwen, go ahead. I'm sorry. No problem. Um, as you know. Uh, I worked a lot of years collecting signatures to try to stop fracking and did a lot of democracy schools. Um, and recently feeling the urgency of uh, climate disruption, uh, well, w particularly with the uh, COVID shutdown, uh, decided that I wanted to spend my energies um, doing things that did not require asking permission of people who weren't going to give us permission to do anything. And um, so recently I've started doing some Zooms with uh, some uh, documentaries about climate disruption. And I'm lucky enough to live in a county in which a lot of people are already doing what I'd call good things. <laughs> and I've recently begun to get some pe local people together to talk about what how we can expand some of the things they're doing and how we can collaborate on projects like a local restorative farm and a, a wonderful park district that wants to expand the land that is park related and um, working with watersheds uh, in our areas and some things like that. And I wonder if that isn't one way to get around the fact, you know, just say, okay, the, the political parties, forget them. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean not vote because voting does have consequences, but, um, you know, don't don't necessarily put your energy there, but put your right. energy in getting getting ordinary people together to talk about what is it we can do that doesn't require permission. <laughs> you can start a time right. bank. 
There are a lot of things you can do without permission. So I, I think that's one of the key things that needs to be done. The system isn't working for us. It's working, it's using us and we're it's not serving us. Because and, designed to do that it is that that's exactly what the point of of all of this the the book and all of it is that to demonstrate that the system is put together in a way is very difficult for us as individuals to navigate our way through it or even understand how the puzzle it's it's like a maze of law and how does it even work and it appears that maybe there's a way out of this maze when in fact there isn't um and and that's the you know that's nobody wants to hear that that's the the first obstacle that we're up against as organizers and and as activists is nobody wants to hear bad news and then when you do tell them about it they don't believe it because that's not what they were taught um but when they experience it because they're out there actually as you've done with petitioning and so forth and you try to get things done and you find out that it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter to the system what you do. It's going to do what it does. Um, and so finding alternative projects, alternative systems and processes in your community makes an awful lot of sense. And it's something that we're pursuing and developing programs on with CELDEF on how to assist people to do that. Um, we've got a lot of work to do. But I, but when I think that that's exactly right, we have to say we have to look at the system that is in opposition to people. In other words, it's antisocial. We have to look at it as irrelevant. If you're not going to work with us, we're not going to pay any attention to it. We're going to go and do what we need to do, and that can even mean holding your own elections locally and not asking whether or not they're sanctioned by the state or by the federal government to say, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna make decisions and we're gonna do it in a democratic way. And that's the way it is. And if nobody likes it, too bad, we do. Because we are free people. Well, we're not. We're not free people if we don't actually take up that kind of a lifestyle and say, we're going to live that way. We're gonna live like we mean it. We're gonna live on the premise that we have these rights. That's the underlying message of all of this. We have to begin to live like we mean it, like we mean that these ideals are worth something to us and they're worth more than just talking about them and saying that they're wrong not to let us have them. Take them. Don't ask. I'm going to move on just so, and, and we'll have some time, I think, to, to talk some more here, but there's a very short section I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through here. It's um, titled, There's a Right of Communities to Govern Themselves, and it's called Freedom. The right of the people to local community self-government continues to be suffocated by the special privileges protected in American law as the rights of property and the privileges those rights convey to the wealthy. The result is that democracy is subordinated to those special privileges. Through tradition, precedent, case law, and a false system of so-called justice, the fate of every American is tied to whatever, whatever an opulent property class contrives to accomplish. All because the Federalists refused to trust the people, believe they knew better than anyone what all of us want and what we need. The current conservative campaign for voter suppression, hostility toward immigrants, and the disenfranchising effects of mass incarceration continue to drive the drive to privatize control over who will and who will not vote, and whether the votes that are cast can have any effect on policy and power. The courts deny collective community rights exist as reflected in the near eradication of class action suits and the aggressive judicial defense of Dillon's rule. Collectivization of rights prevails only insofar as corporations are argued to be voluntary associations of people rather than legal entities with rights of their own. 
the collectivist right to exercise self-government is permitted within so-called private corporations only because the sole legal purpose of such a corporation is profitable accumulation, privatization, and the creation of property. It's the bricklaying of empire. And that's all there is to that little short piece. And I'll, I'll just go on to the next. Community local self-government in action today. The Lafayette, Colorado Climate Bill of Rights and Protections Ordinance adopted on March 17, 2017, included this statement, quote, all residents of the city of Lafayette possess the right to a form of governance which recognizes that all power is inherent in the people of the city and that all free governments are founded on the people's authority and consent. Laws adopted by the people of the city shall only be preempted or nullified if they interfere with rights secured by the state or federal constitution to the people of the city, or if they interfere with protections provided to the people or ecosystems of the city by state, federal, or international law, end quote. This is um, an ordinance that um, my colleagues and I uh, drafted for the folks in Lafayette. To ensure that the rights of communities would continue to stand even against preemptions by legislatures and precedent addicted judges, dozens of communities have included citizen enforcement provisions in their local laws, including the one enacted by Plymouth, New Hampshire on January 25th, 2018. And this is one that uh, Michelle knows all about. She has been our organizer in New Hampshire. The project threatening the community's rights is known as the Northern Pass, a large unsustainable energy corridor industrialists want to route from Canada across the state. <clears throat> Part of the people's declaration regarding the proposal stated this, quote, we the people of Plymouth declare that unsustainable energy projects violate the right of Plymouth residents, including our right to make decisions about what happens to the places where we live. We, the people of Plymouth, find that certain commercial energy projects are economically and environmentally unsustainable in that they damage property values and ecosystems, place the health of residents at risk, threaten the quality of natural systems within the town while failing to provide real benefits to the people of this community." End quote. And I think that goes to, uh, Gwen, your point about people taking things uh, and responsibility for their own protections on themselves. The town warrant, the warrant is the, the proposed law. The town warrant went on, quote, we the people of Plymouth find the current environmental laws allow state chartered corporations to inflict damage on local ecosystems that cannot be reversed violating the rights of residents to protect their community and the rights of ecosystems to exist, end quote. And then they included the citizen enforcement section, and it reads this way, quote, the town of Plymouth or any natural person domiciled in Plymouth may enforce all of the provisions of this law through an action brought in any court possessing jurisdiction over activities occurring within Plymouth. In such an action, the town of Plymouth or the natural person shall be entitled to recover all costs of litigation, including without limitation, expert and attorney's fees, end quote. Other communities have taken a further step embracing their rights as the highest law. Thanks to the good work of CELDEF's organizer, Chad Nicholson, Grant Township in Pennsylvania, of which much has been written, was one of the earliest communities to legalize nonviolent direct action in defense of community rights. Here's that part of their home rule ordinance enacted in May of 2016 under the heading right to directly enforce people's rights. It says this, quote, if a court fails to to uphold the, great, the Grant Township Home Rule Charter's limitation on corporate power or otherwise fails to uphold the rights secured by Article 1 of the Charter, the rights and prohibitions secured by the Charter shall not be affected by that 
judicial failure. And any natural person may then enforce the rights and provisions of the charter through direct action. If enforcement through nonviolent direct action is commenced, this law shall prohibit any private or public actor from bringing criminal charges or filing any civil or other criminal action against those participating in nonviolent direct action, end quote. It's no mystery why American courts will find that statement in, the, in their law as illegitimate and unenforceable. Just as the Declaration of Independence's assertion that to secure these unalienable rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. That language in the Declaration of Independence was illegal in the eyes of the British Empire. Of course it was. It challenged its power. Justifications for the American Revolution was premised on wholly different values than those held by the Federalists who wrote the counter-revolutionary property and commerce U.S. Constitution. The judges who channel those long-dead Federalists are no friends of democracy. Of course not. It's not their job. Because the interests of local communities involve the preservation and protection of rights other than the rights of property, they have been divorced from the Federalist frame of government. We the people are in exile so long as we do not take a stand for our legitimate rights, chief among them, the right to govern collectively with our neighbors in our communities. Self-government is up to us, not political parties and their hand-picked minions. Democracy is trickle up, not trickle down. And that's it. That's the end end of the chapter. It's kind of a little bit of a short one, actually, this month. Um, but we have a little bit of time if you'd like to discuss any of this. And it's a short chapter, but I think that there's a kind of encapsulate uh, encapsulates a lot of the issues, a lot of the problems that we face when we think about um, what we can do to protect ourselves, to protect our communities. And, you know, we have here we have a, a climate crisis and we have the sixth great extinction going on uh, globally. And the thing is, these aren't just planetary issues. Every bit of pollution, every bit of harm that's been done to the planet, every bit of harm that is done to human beings in their communities because our so-called economy requires it. Um, they, every one of those harms takes place in a particular place. Every coal-fired incinerator that's spewing carbon into the atmosphere is situated in somebody's hometown. Every nuclear facility, every toxic waste dump, you name the, the assault on the environment, and it happens in somebody's backyard. And one of the main reasons it happens is because the people who live there have been stripped of the authority to do anything to stop it. What if they weren't stripped of that? Do you think the outcomes might be different if we were allowed to say, nope, can't poison my water? Nope, can't do that here. What if every community actually was recognized to have the authority to say no? to activities that do harm to the community, that externalize the costs of cleanup of that mess? What if we actually had democratic rights right where we live? I think the outcomes would be great. I mean, and, and they would be global, collectively global. And that and, is uh, really, if you think about why, why is it that we have been going at this, um, effort for community rights so diligently and not and, and not blinking, not moving away from the place-based rights movement that has to happen. And I see that there are hands up, so let's let's yeah. hear from you. And we also have a question in chat. 
Um, so I'll read, I'll read that one. Um, asking what happened in Grant Township, uh, PA, Lafayette, Colorado, and Plymouth, New Hampshire since 2016, 17, and 18. More specifically, for example, what has happened with the protection of direct action in Grant Township? What challenges have come to the Colorado ordinance to prevent preemption? And what happened in New Hampshire? Well, that's an awful lot to cover. and <laughs> uh, probably not going to be able to cover all of it. Um, but the fact is that um, people made took these stands in their laws. Um, and you shouldn't be surprised to know that the system pushed back and said, nope, you're not allowed to do that. So why bother doing it? Um, in Grant Township, actually, and it's an interesting thing, over 10 years of litigation, the people have been fighting to stop uh, an injection well, a frac waste injection well from being cited in their community. This is a town where the people get all their drinking water from the same ground that they were going to pump these toxins into. And they said, no, they passed an ordinance the court overturned their ordinance. They passed a home rule charter and included the ban and the rights of nature and the rights of the community in their charter. And they were sued, not just by the PGE Corporation that wanted to put in the injection well, but by, by the State Department of Environmental Protection for daring to protect their environment too much. Now that sounds crazy, right? Come on, you gotta give me that. That sounds pretty crazy. Um, eventually, the DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, and I, I can't get into all the details of the case. It's 10 years of litigation. Um, but you can read about some of it. Uh, um, Rolling Stone magazine did a couple of big articles on Grant Township, and it's been um, written up in, in lots of other uh, publications as well. Look at our website, look at Seldef's website, and there's lots of information there about it. Um, but the fact is that Grand Township did not get an injection well. As a matter of fact, it's now been capped. When I say capped, they poured concrete down the pipe and sealed it up. Um, and the people said, you know, if we allow this to happen, uh, we could lose our drinking water like the people in Dimmick, Pennsylvania did. And we're not going to step back. We're not going to surrender and say, oh, never mind. You can bankrupt the town if you want to. It doesn't matter. We don't have much. It's a small town. But we're not going to agree. We're not going to let you come in. Um, as it turns out, the injection well and the or the the well that was already there, the pipe that was down for had been there for years for uh, kind of traditional extraction of gas, not fracking. Um, that's what they were going to use is that pipe. Um, and it turns out that it was leaking. And had they used it for an injection well, their water, their drinking water would have been certainly contaminated. So after all these years, um, in, in essence, the people there have been vindicated. Will the system admit it? Will the system say, oh, we're so sorry, we were wrong and you were right? Absolutely not. So what's happened there? They didn't get the injection well, but they didn't win in court either. The court is the, not the place where we're going to get our rights. We're gonna get our rights by demanding them. It's like the civil rights movement. Those rights were won in the streets, not in the Supreme Court, not in Congress. They were won in the streets by the people. Um, I just wanted to make a suggestion. You, you, you said that you, that Seldef was thinking of working um, with local communities on on uh, the kind of organizing that is not necessarily asking permission, but just doing stuff. And something occurred to me as a result of this discussion is what what if Seldef took all the names of all the people, who have read your book, who have, uh, you know, get the cell death newsletter and, and have participated in any of these uh, kind of events, democracy schools or anything like that, and 
started a democracy cafe, for lack of a better name, <laughs> um, in which um, on some regular basis, once a month, once a week, um, you know, somebody would volunteer to be the Zoom host and people within a state could just get together and talk about what they're doing, what they have done, and, and really, really grassroots, <laughs> not, you know, not, not telling, not webinar, not, you know, that, but, but real grassroots. And, and I want to, part of this idea comes from the, the book I just put in chat, Damon Santola is a researcher who has researched all kinds of change, ranging from, um, you know, why do uh, cute puppy dogs memes go viral on Twitter or whatever it is, um, to Black Lives Matter and uh, big social movements and uh, even literal viruses, how they spread. And uh, um, the, the quick takeaway is that big social movements do not spread the same way viruses spread. <laughs> it's more complicated. <laughs> um, yeah, it's always more complicated. But, <laughs> but but he has done serious research and even some clinical research. And uh, it's uh, worth any, everybody reading who wants to make changes. But uh, I think it would be great to, to know that on some regular basis, if you wanted to talk to people, no matter where they are, there was a Zoom that you could regularly tap into and just talk with other people in other communities without having to drive there or fly there or whatever. So Thanks, just Glenn. appreciate the, the thought. And it's, um, you know, we, we're certainly going to be having um, online gatherings for, on, on various things. Um, but one of the one I think I would say about it is we want to make sure that we're not just gathering to share stories, but that we're we're actually making plans to involve ourselves in the communities. And so it, it's um it is complicated because although we we kind of have this idea, it's like the bigger the demonstration, the better. Well that's good for people to find each other and to identify each other as allies. It's lousy for changing the system because the system doesn't care if you gather 30,000 people or however many people. It really doesn't mu much matter. It's good for some things, for organizing and building you know, those connections. But then it matters that we don't stay in the, the large groups. We need to break up and get involved in the actions. And that's the thing where, and I'm not saying your suggestion isn't something to, to try, but I think that we need to make sure that what we're coming out with is um, that we're being helpful as an organization. We have limited numbers of people, limited resources. What's the best way to use them? And one of the way, things that we have not done, and that, I'm not just talk, talking about CELDEF, but all of the folks who think that, yeah, we've got to make some changes in this society um, for the good, to, to preserve rights and to preserve the environment and all of it, um, and, and for social justice. What we haven't been too good at is creating a movement that lasts. You know, we, when we think about what Occupy Wall Street accomplish well 
it popularized a meme. That's, I think, the biggest thing, it, in my opinion, that it did. And that meme is, you know, the 1% versus the 99%. People started to understand that that's where the source of the problem is. is. There are there is a privileged minority and a underprivileged majority when it comes to all kinds of things, making decisions in particular. Um, how are we going to put together the social movement that's going to bring about the changes? And it's okay to share information for lots of people to do that and to share experiences. Yep, that's got to be part of it. I think we need to start connecting people who are doing the doing and have them working together and sharing their knowledge and expertise. And that's one of the things, and then put them in touch with the large groups that you're talking about, you know, the numbers of people that we've worked with in the past, because not all of them are, you know, are career organizers, so to speak. Not all of them know how to, do, they've been involved. Um, but I think that we are working on trying to put people in touch with folks who can help them to do the independent kind of parallel or um, non-subordinate, no asking permission kinds of actions that you were talking about earlier. And I'm gonna let's pause for a minute. Um, Samantha, you had something? Yeah. Um, Samantha, you have your hand up? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. Um, yes. I just want to say thank you. And I also, you brought something to my mind earlier about sort of how democracy functions in general in terms of how we vote and what we vote for. And it, it struck something really interesting. Um, I never really thought about how the way that we tend to think of democracy is there are proposed pieces of legislation or regulations that are proposed to the public, and then we have the opportunity to go in and vote on them. But I want what you struck in me was well, there's also the democracy of the, the quote unquote rules or what is desired for a structure and for organizing society to come from the people not to come from the government officials who are creating these pieces of legislation that are 50 million pages long and nobody reads them, but to actually ask the people, what is it that you want to see enacted here? And that also brings up the question in me of, if you asked people that, if you asked people, what kind of regulations do you wanna see I don't even know in myself that I would have an answer to that. I don't even know what I would necessarily say I want to see a regulation on. And so it's sort of, it strikes an interesting chord around maybe we have everything we need. Maybe we have all the tools already. We actually don't need the government to do all this. We don't need the, so many officials to exist. We don't need these things that we have become so dependent on and so reliant on to give us structure like maybe we don't need them much at all <laughs> it's a good point and uh when you put it that way think about it for most of human history we didn't have them we didn't have the structure we didn't have the regulatory agencies you know the argument that says well we need to regulate industry um, sure makes sense to me. We don't want industry to be running rampant and doing what they want, but they do anyway, even though we have regulation, which makes you stop and think, well, let's look at what do you mean regulation then if it, if it actually lets them do whatever they want. And it turns out that uh, as uh, we talked about in an earlier session, that the regulatory fallacy, as we call it, is um, it's a scam. It, it was intended from the very beginning to create the illusion that the government was going to protect the people from irresponsible industrial activities. When in fact, 
um, it's meant to keep it's meant to put up a barrier between the people and the perpetrators, the corporations. The government steps in. You want to talk? You want to do something about what um, you know Exxon is doing? Come talk to your government agency. You don't go to Exxon and say, stop it or we'll burn your house down. You go to the agency and you say, please don't issue them a permit to poison our water. And then the agency says, we'd love to help you, but you know what? The rules say we have to give them the permit. So they're getting the permit. They're going to ruin your water. End of story. I mean, it's not it's not even that government can't be helpful or useful. It's that it has been constructed to be just the opposite. And at the, in the process, deceive us. You know, if, if there's one tool that is used against the majority by the minority of privileged people, it's deception. It's the most effective tool they have. But it's ingenious the way it's done. I What I wrote about in this book, um, I think, um, I know there's a lot more. I, it does not cover the whole gamut. It's not the whole process. Um, but I wanted to, in terms, in the context of local community self-determination, what are the obstacles? And that's really what this is about. Do we need those obstacles? You know, to your point, do we really need government that much? No, because they're the very, they're the very systems that are, are, depriving us of the ability to protect our own health and safety and our community's health and safety. And when I say community, I include the local environment. That's part of our community. I've got the oxygen that was just exhaled by the trees in my lungs right now. They're part of my community. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I, I think one of the biggest obstacles is people look at the u.s government like it's so some historic monolithic you know big block of granite that's that's if it's going to go away it's going to erode like very slowly like like in geological time not so it's just rules made up by human beings to scam other human beings and trick them into doing things that will benefit them instead of themselves that's the that's the simple truth of it. Understanding what game they and what the labyrinth is that they put together for us to run through. Um, yeah, that's the exercise I, I put myself through to to write this. And and but it came not just out of um, you know some kind of intellectual curiosity. It was looking for some answers to why it's not possible given a system that is described self-described as you know democratic the land of the free and the home of the brave and all the let's sing all the songs and wave all the flags and guess what it still doesn't stop the fracking and it still doesn't stop your poisoning of the water and it still doesn't it doesn't fix any of it and if it doesn't fix any of it who needs it let's change it Being careful to know that there are people who would love to have um, chaos going on and replace the system we have for one that's just as screwed up, but in new ways. <laughs> we can say worse, but frankly, I, I don't know what's worse uh, than running towards a cliff where we're going to kill the planet um, without changing if we don't change course. I don't know what's worse than that. Yeah, there, there's worse. There, you know, we could have, um, you know, armed guards in the streets and at the school. Well, we do have them at the school, so we're getting there. Um, you know, it'll be. It's, it'll be. Sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. It'll be really interesting to see because I've been hearing a lot, and I'm sorry if this gets off on a little bit of a tangent. Um, I've been hearing so much recently about the accumulating debt and it's not just in the united states but all over the world the how so much of our structure and our system is based on financing through debt and so we have this enormous ballooning 
where so many people are are unable to pay anywhere close to what is actually owed. And so that to me also brings in this interesting question around property and, and the property class. And if everything is essentially based off of debt, it, when that explodes, if that collapses, does that mean that the property class is also going to feel some semblance of a collapse if, if their property is based off of debt? Well, it is. And and debt is sold and traded as though it were, you know, golden in the hand. Um, and it's a hell of a system. It's really, really interesting. And I don't I don't pretend to be an economist. Um, and I'm happy to say that, actually, because I think economists live in a fantasy world. But um, the fact is that debt of that sort. What is debt? Is it a black hole? Somebody owns a black hole? No, it's debt is if you think, well, what's money? You know, what is what's money? What's what is that stuff? Um, is a dollar bill really worth a dollar? It's just a piece of paper. Is it, you know, back when Nixon got rid of the gold standard, um, you know, 1970 something, um, you know, it used to be that, well, we have this dollar. It's called a Federal Reserve note. And it stands for so much gold. And that's how we decide what it's worth. But even that is artificial. It's just a yellow piece of metal. Why is it worth anything? You know, what's why is the paper? Why is the gold? And, but as it is now, it's even stranger because everything is so abstract. Um, there is nothing backing it up. And, you know, when the Federal Reserve um, changes the interest rate and they either print money or take money out of circulation. They're manipulating the economy, right? But there, there's some things they can't, they're not going to be able to manipulate. You can't manipulate debt because it's a negative. It's a, it's a whole, you know? It's, it's also interesting to me when I think about it. Uh, what money is it's essentially a promissory note of labor i mean that's one if i loan you ten thousand um, dollars you'll pay it back but you'll pay me back fifteen thousand over so many years and that's what it'll add up to so i make a profit where does the extra five come from who puts that into circulation well the money is printed nobody no, and, and what does it mean it means that it actually it does have a personal value because the extra five thousand is the extra work I'm going to put in on the clock at my job to make that money to give it to the bank because I owe it to them for borrowing the ten. Now I owe them that five on top of it. Um, so their guarantee is that I'm going to give them my indentured servitude to pay it back to pay the interest. And the whole economy is in many ways just built on the idea of indentured servitude. And what's fascinating to me, and I, I, I don't know, I can't be too eloquent about um, talking about money because if, if I find it distasteful, but it's also um, not my area of expertise, to be honest. But when you think about it, it's not just the money somebody can pay back in the next couple of years. How can the United States pay back? I don't I don't even remember what the number is. Thirteen trillion dollars debt. Thirteen trillion dollars. If you laid the, the dollar bills flat on the ground, 13 trillion would go to the moon and back to the earth and to the moon and back to the earth and to the moon and back to the earth. That much money will never, ever, ever, ever be created. That much labor will never, ever, ever be worked where is that money how can that really be real how can it ever be really repaid and the answer is it can't and in 2008 when we had a financial collapse what happened you said isn't that going to hurt the wealthy class too shit no they passed the law and they said we're going to put the we're going to put the people you know they say the government but that means taxpayers they're going to put the people in debt so that we're going to take the that that debt that now your grandchildren are going to have to work to pay off 
because we're that far out or we're even further. And we're going to take that that money that we just created, we're printing it and give it to the banks and say, see, you're OK now. Future generations of our, of our grandkids aren't, but the banks are. And the economy is saved. We save the economy by enslaving the grandkids. We save the economy by killing the environment. We save the economy by going to war. We save the economy by taking away people's rights. And now we know what's most important in the United States of America. Profit. And not, by the way, just in the United States of America, but that's where we are.